morning, everyone, and welcome to Outside the Echo Chamber. Here we are coming to you from the Frontier Studios, HD Media Building at 1001 Virginia Street East, downtown Charleston. Thanks to the Media Center with Dan and Maria and Ethan and the gang to putting this show on together for us. Hey, we're two days, two days after the May 10th primary election. Election 2022 primary has come and gone. But guess what? That left a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to talk about. And, you know, we're really excited to have with us back today on our show is Mark Blankenship, who is president and CEO of MBE Enterprises. Mark Blankenship is with us today. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. Hey, you know, you were on just before the election. We were talking politics. We were talking polls. And that's what you do. You are the West Virginia poll guru. And let's dive right in. You know, we had a, uh, we had an article in the paper today. It talked about 10 legislatures. They face defeat after after election, and that's what happens when you redistrict, right? You know, we packed a lot of people into a 100 single-member district. So, what was your uh, what was your take on this election day? Well, you know, let me start kind of on the macro perspective. Conservatives did really well across uh, West Virginia, and I think that in part is is based on on issues. West Virginia voters are still focused on really three key issues, uh, and it hasn't changed. It's jobs and the economy. It's in roads and infrastructure development, and it's solving the drug abuse problem in, in the state. And conservative voters uh, are no different, their Republican voters are no different than sort of the bigger West Virginia voter audience in that they want those same three things too. And look, I think that's why you see some of these folks that are extremely popular, Joe Manchin, Shelley Capito, uh, Jim Justice, because their focus is on what? Their focus is on infrastructure development, building roads and highways and, and Internet. It's on creating jobs. Those two are certainly related. And it's, uh, you know, going at the drug abuse issue the best that they can. And I think at the local level, you saw a lot of candidates, conservative candidates who took a conservative approaches to those issues. Issues that were very successful, and you know, you talk about the state senate races, the house delegate races, um, you know, the conservative leaders of those bodies, Craig Blair and Speaker Roger Henshaw, they had pretty good days. Most of their candidates won. Most of the uh, either incumbents that were there uh, or conservatives that were challengers uh, in races, most of those guys won. So I think what you're seeing is West Virginians um, saying we want those kinds of conserv, be them Democrat or Republican, we want those. Those kinds of conservative approaches to those key issues. You know, you hit the, you, you touched on a lot there, and we're going to touch on a couple yeah. of those things. And first up, we can't, we can't start off the show without talking about that big congressional race. Absolutely. Right? And you touched on infrastructure, mm -hmm. you touched on issues and stuff like that. And that was kind of the one race where maybe the rest of West Virginia was a little different because McKinley almost got penalized for voting for an infrastructure bill, or do you think it didn't matter because Mooney came out and that the Trump factor was just so I, I, hard to overcome? So we have done polling that showed really significant support for infrastructure development in West Virginia uh, as recently as, as late last winter. What I think that race came down to was certainly Donald Trump. I think that President Trump uh, came in early and endorsed uh, Congressman Mooney, and Congressman Mooney opened up a wide lead early on. Then everything got sort of quiet, right? And David McKinley, who's a fighter and, and a longtime uh, conservative Republican in West Virginia, he clawed his way back into that race, got it closer. Then what happened? President Trump came back into that race, uh, did a teletown hall. They got that message out on uh, television and things, you know, radio and all of that, what Donald Trump said about Alex Mooney in that teletown hall. And guess what happened? Boom. His lead started exploding again. So, you know, President Trump uh, is still a, a really popular figure in West Virginia. And there's no two ways about it. Um, I don't think that the, you know, some of those other granular issues like infrastructure hurt uh, David McKinley. Uh, in fact, they you know, I would say that they probably helped. They kept him in that game uh, because West Virginians want roads. They want bridges. They want inter Internet access. They want all of these things. And, and, you know, certainly that bill delivered on it. Well, you know, we talked about the Trump factor and mm -hmm. the Trump factor. It, it was did you were you surprised by how big a margin Mooney or was that pretty much what you expected and what you saw? A little bit. You know, it wouldn't have surprised me if it was low double digits, if it was 10, plus 10, plus 11, plus 12, because I think you saw that over the over the closing weeks. Uh, and look, uh, listen, David McKinley had a lot of groups that were working against him, spending money against him. 
uh, and Alex Mooney did a good job at delivering his message, talking about President Trump, talking about the America First agenda, and appealing to core conservative GOP voters mm -hmm. in that primary. And so it, it surprised me that it got as out of hand as it did at the end, but it didn't surprise me that Mooney won and that he won big. So when you, we tie it all together and we'll wrap out, <clears throat> out of that race, but messaging. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you think, so based on what you said, and Mooney's message resonated better with the voters, obviously, based on the outcome, yeah. or did McKinley just miss the mark on his message and could have done a better job? No, I think it was hard for McKinley, and he's, and look, he has, he has working for him, he had some of the most talented people in, in the business, in national politics. I, I think Alex Mooney said what? Alex Mooney said, I am pro-Trump, I'm pro-America <laughs> first, I'm a conservative guy. David McKinley then had to be put on the defensive and say, this is why I voted for the January 6th commission. This is, this is why I did that. So there was a stark contrast, and I think it was hard uh, for McKinley to explain that against Mooney's backdrop of, I'm the Donald Trump guy. Hey, so, we, so that message, you know, Trump, and it's low voter turnout, you know, mm -hmm. or, or voter turnout, which probably was as expected in an off-presidential election, mm -hmm. but low voter turnout. And then within the Republican Party, we had, the, uh, we had executive committee members from Kanawha County Republican and then the Democratic, and they talked about the type of voter that came out. Because yeah. now you're seeing within the Republican Party the different facets. Of people. Yeah. you got your far, far right, you got your more moderates, or you got your, your more Christian voters, and then you, have, then you have just those that stay home yeah. because nobody – excited them to come out mm -hmm. and vote. So in that race, it seemed to be like the, the pro-Trumpers, the more far rights came out. McKinley was kind of labeled more of a moderate, I guess, Republican. Is that correct? Yeah, I, th I think conservatives, you know, and in any primary election, you know, uh, the, the more liberal elements of the Democrat uh, Party will come out and vote in primaries, typically. That's what they call base voters. Mm -hmm. The more conservative elements of the, the Republican Party will come out and vote in the GOP primaries, base voters. So whenever you hear people talking about base voters, voters, that's what they mean, or people who are a little bit more ideologically defined or solid in their positions, you know. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me. It happens in, in every election. It's why you see, you know, sort of some more liberals winning Democrat primaries uh, in city council races or state legislative races because... The base comes out. The base vote. comes out. Those are the ones you can you can bank on. Well, hey, we're going to take a we're going to take a quick break, sure. Mark, because we, we're talking about congressional races. When we come back, we're going to talk about state senate races mm -hmm. and maybe some of the House of Delegate races that might have surprised you. When we come back on outside the echo chamber, we know who we are, where we've been, where we're going. Like hospitals all over America, we are changing, redefining, restructuring ourselves to be the best community health system in the region we serve. We are two hospitals with more than 30 locations, 450 providers, and one mission to heal. As one, we are Thomas Health, caring for our communities today and tomorrow. Proudly advocating for workers and their families, the West Virginia AFL-CIO is a group of 600 labor organizations representing 70,000 active and 70,000 retired union members. We represent first responders, healthcare workers, educators, coal miners, construction workers, plant workers, truck drivers, grocery store clerks, and every job in between. We believe every worker has the right to fair wages, good benefits, and a safe workplace. That's what the West Virginia AFL-CIO fights for every day. A new day begins, and what happens today must be covered, reported, and passed on to everyone in the region we serve. We are journalists, staff writers, editors, storytellers. Who are we? We are HD Media, trustworthy and always here for the times we live in. What started as the Parmar Oil Company in 1967 has grown into 116 convenience stores in four states. Parmar convenience stores offer monthly product specials and grab-and-go items. Located just down the street from where you live, Parmar stores are all about being your above-par convenience store. If you don't have a Parmar store near you now, you will soon. Parmar convenience stores, neighbors serving your community and making life a little bit easier every day.
Welcome back, everybody. We're here on Outside the Echo Chamber. I'm your host, Doug Scaff, talking with Mark Blankenship from Mark Blankenship Enterprises, you know, a, a pollster extraordinaire here in West Virginia. And we just got done talking about the, the, the statewide effect in the Congress race. Well, now let's see what that Trump effect and as you move down into the Senate and House races, how that may have affected or didn't affect those races. Mark, one race in particular, you know, there was a few out there. Uh, take, for example, down in Raleigh County, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Trump factor, for example. And you had uh, Mick Bates, former Democrat, turned Republican, going against an incumbent, Roland Roberts. And they both, you know, uh, Mar uh, Mick pledged his support and loyal support to Trump and tried to tried to entice voters that he was the Trump chosen one. And it didn't play out so well for him. What, what do you... What do you make of that? Well, you could argue that it did. You could argue that uh, someone with not a whole lot of Republican bona fides, right? He was a Democrat uh, just last year. Uh, but yet he turned a race against a, an incumbent state senator, Republican, pretty conservative guy. He turned that race into a really close race, right? Um, uh, and I think it probably surprised a lot of people that it was that close. So I think that, that uh, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't discount the Trump uh, narrative there. I would say that the incumbency is hard. Roberts ran a good race. Uh, and Roberts uh, hit some of those key conservative uh, issues that we had just talked about. But he also has a history of being a known Republican. Whereas Bates, I, you know, I, I still think Bates has to, prove himself mm -hmm. a little bit to the Republican base voters that we just talked about. And I think he probably did a lot of that in this recent election. You know, he got whatever it was, 2,000 some odd votes and, and uh, lost by a couple of points to, to Roland Roberts. But, I, you know, I, I, I think that the, what happened there was the incumbency uh, and the known conservative against a guy who's maybe not necessarily known yet as a conservative guy. And then you shift focus to the Eastern Panhandle, mm -hmm. similar situation. Yep. You had a Democrat and Jason, very moderate conservative yep. Democrat, I guess, switch to Republican, but that was a little different, right? Talk yeah, that to me was about an that. open seat. That so, was an open seat. Okay. So there wasn't an incumbent, and it was, in fact, you know, because of redistricting, the Eastern Panhandle gets that so new seat, new seat okay. uh, I guess you could call it. And Bates, uh, who who's a former Democrat, switched to the Republican Party, ran against a uh, uh, kind of a party in, insider, like a county uh, chairwoman or something like that, I think was her title uh, at the time. So so Bates didn't have an incumbent to run against. Barrett. Barrett. Or, I'm sorry, yeah. Barrett didn't have an incumbent to run against uh, and ran an open seat. And I think he ran as a, a, a you know, certainly right of center candidate. Uh, and it ended up winning by 10 points. You know, I think those two races alone can show you or demonstrate to you the power of the incumbency, right? It's, yes. It's, it's a thing. And I think uh, one more race, you know, that's had much talked about, especially down here at Senate District 8, yeah. where we had uh, Andrea Kiesling, uh, who was ruled ineligible, mm -hmm. uh, who was a very popular candidate, and she was getting a lot of traction, but was ruled ineligible because of residency requirements. But then it leaves you with another Democrat turned Republican, Mark Hunt on the Republican ballot. Uh, there was another another candidate, Joshua Higginbotham, lifelong mm -hmm. Republican that you know and everyone knows about him. And then there was a think a, a, a fourth third, can, or third Mitchum, candidate, yeah, Mitchum, who we, we didn't hear too much about him. But we had him we had him on the show and we talked about. So now, how does that play out? Now you have an interesting primary with a former Democrat, Mark Hunt, who wasn't endorsed by the established party because Andrea was the chosen mm -hmm. one. Let's just be let's be clear. Sure. And then. Richard Lindsay, a formidable Democratic 100%. opponent who's, who's been a lifelong Democrat here in Kanawha County. What do you think of that race? A lot. <laughs> Lots um, of unpack there. A Andrea uh, Kiesling is, it, you know, it's, it was really shocking to watch her race, how popular she became, how quickly she became. Uh, she got real, real popular among voters real, real quick. And I'll bet you'll find out that she got thousands of votes in that race that weren't counted. You know, so one would argue that a lot of the conservative voters in that race were disenfranchised by a court ruling. You know, their votes aren't counted. They just set them to the side. So what you have now are the remaining three candidates and the plurality winner of those, not a majority, but the plurality uh, winner gets the nomination. And I think Mark Hunt... You know, there's no other way to say it. He's got a lot, just like we talked about Bates, mm -hmm. Mark Hunt has significant explaining to do <laughs> to conservative voters in this district, right? 
there are a lot of conservatives in that Senate district. It stretches from Roan County down to Kanawha and a little bit over to Putnam, I believe, and, and Jackson. And there's a lot of conservative voters there, man, whether they're Democrats or whether they're Republicans. And what are they looking for? Jobs, infrastructure, and drug abuse. Mark Hunt doesn't really have a whole lot of street cred on those issues. <laughs> it, you know, I, I mean, let's just be honest. He was yeah. a former, or well, he's a current personal injury lawyer uh, and former Democrat, and one, one would argue a, a relatively liberal Democrat at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so he'll have a lot of his bar is extremely yeah. high. So, on the other hand, Senator Lindsey, uh, minority leader in the state Senate. Uh, I would say that most people view him mo as a moderate to a slightly conservative Democrat, right? Mm -hmm. Conservative Democrats are the ones that are winning elections. That's the end of, end of the story. They're winning in the general elections. They're winning in the general elections uh, when they're there. It's the Joe Manchins, it's the Doug Scaffs, it's the uh, Senator Lindsey's. Um, you know, those, those folks are, are winning elections and they're winning it for a reason. So what does Hunt do? So Hunt has to explain, I'm... I'm actually the more conservative guy than Lindsey, and Lindsey says, "You know me. I'm here. I've been here for several years." So it's a, the hurdles. Uh, it's a high one for Hunt. A high one. I, yeah. I, you know. I yeah, would, and you know, you know, one thing Mark has, I guess you could say, he has a little name recognition. He does. He's ran for probably everything on the ballot, and uh, in the past 12 years, I think, in his career. But but you're right. Mm -hmm. So it's now. It didn't work well for Bates in Southern West Virginia trying to convince voters that he was a new new Republican, mm -hmm. and now we're anxious to see how it plays out here. In this Higginbotham district. got few thousand votes. He did. And Mitchum got several, uh, you know, I, I don't know if he was over a thousand, but probably yeah. something like that. Andrea Kiesling probably got several thousand votes. Look at the number of voters that didn't vote for Hunt in a primary. Now, to be successful in a general, you've got to be able to codify and solidify all of those votes first mm -hmm. before you can go take on and try to win Democrat votes. You do, know? You, do you think, were you surprised that, I mean, how how sharply they kind of turned on Josh Higginbotham, so to speak, because he never really was given a fair shake. Uh, he switched. He was never switched parties. He was a lifelong Republican. But then he came out, you know, he came <clears throat> out as an openly gay Republican, and it just seemed like, boom, his chances died right there. I don't know if it was, I don't know if you can boil it down to, you know, an issue of homosexuality versus heterosexuality. I, I think more importantly, look, a lot of Republicans and a lot of Democrats are paying close attention to things like these transgender bathroom bills and, and sports bills. And voters are still trying to figure out exactly where they're landing on those issues. I can tell you right now, at least initially, they're landing against those. Those, you know, allowing... Um, uh, you know, the bathroom bills and, right. the, and the sports bills and those things. Voters have a lot of concerns about those. And I think that that narrative prosecuted against him, I think that, you know, supporting... There's more remember. issues. There's more issues than just that. Right, right. Okay. I got you. Well, hey, we'll take a quick shift here to the legislator races, and then we'll let you get out of here. There was, like we talked about at the beginning of the segment, there are 100 single-member districts. It pitted a lot of incumbents versus incumbents. We had a couple shockers. We had uh, Chad Lovejoy, for mm -hmm. example, was pitted against Rick Griffith, Democrat versus Democrat. Ken Ch Reed. Ken Reed, Eastern Panhandle. Uh, he, he lost against another uh, mm -hmm. incumbent as well. And then you had uh, here in Canal County that hits home Diana Graves. Yeah. She wasn't pitted against an incumbent, but it was kind of a big upset. She was a Republican caucus chair mm -hmm. uh, woman, and she got beat by Andy Shamlin, who was a Nitro City Council person. Mm -hmm. uh, so these races now, you know, because of the new redistricting, you saw, let's see, a 10, here in an article ten in seats. today's paper, 10 legislators face <coughs> defeat, after 10 current legislators face defeat, article done by Lacey Pearson, uh, you know, right here in today's, in today's Charleston Gazette Mail. It's a great read, and it just talks about how things are shifting, mm -hmm. uh, where Republicans now, back in the day it used to be Democrats versus Democrats, right. now it's the Republican primaries were the contested primaries. There wasn't a lot of action on the Democratic right. side, but now, because of the, the so many people registered Republican, you're seeing these primaries, and good current incumbents being challenged. It, it, and it is fascinating. You and I, you know, I, I still like to think we're young men, but we've, <laughs> we've gotten older and we've lived through this shift. Yeah. You know, where we, when, when, when we were in college at WVU, it was all Democrat primaries. That, those were the elections that matters. Mm -hmm. Now it's moving more towards the Republican primaries or the election that matters. 
Diana Graves was a little bit surprising to me, obviously, because I think she's a, a pretty strong candidate. Now, the race was very close. It was really, really close. And Shamblin, I understand, was a popular, you know, as you said, he's a popular city councilman. But what you're seeing in these smaller district, man, personal local politics matter. You know, was, I believe it was Tip O'Neill told Ronald Reagan, all politics is local. All politics are local. And so it becomes more so when they have, when voters have smaller districts, they know Doug Scaff is my delegate, mm -hmm. right? I don't have six delegates anymore. I have Doug Scaff. I know Doug Scaff. Or they have uh, uh, Shamblin or they have Conley, whoever it might be. I know this person. I go to church with this person. I go, you know, it's, it becomes far more about the local politics than it probably does about the bigger macro television advertising direct mail that you see in a gubernatorial campaign or a, or a U.S. Senate campaign. It's who they know the best mm -hmm. yeah. or who they can relate to. Uh, I think, I think Shamblin, he's actually a pastor there in Nitro. So, so he probably knows a lot of, uh, you know, those GOP voters, primary voters, Mary Claire Akers, Judge Akers got, I think if I read it correctly, she got more votes and she was unopposed, but she got more votes than any Kanawha County candidate. Mm. Uh, at all, you know, that ran Combined in the whole, those, yeah. Yeah, that, that ran in the whole county, and it was a judicial election. So she got votes from both, Democrats, both Republicans, and Independents. And why? I think probably because she's known to voters. You know, she was a prosecutor for years. Again, that local politic flavor. She was known to voters. She was a prosecutor. She, that she kids in the community, kids in, sports, in the community, yeah. and she worked her tail off to make sure that voters still knew her, even though she was unopposed. Yes. She didn't take it for granted. And That's a good point. as a result, you get tens of well, thousands of votes. You know, we're, it's, I'm anxious for the fall. Mm -hmm. See what happens. It's going you know, to be, be an interesting fall, that's for sure. And now we have, and everybody sits back and plans. And I know we're going to have you on you again. Uh, you do a fantastic job with your I polling. I love it, man. I love, uh, I love coming You love on. talking politics. Love so coming on. We'll have you back on. We'll kind of have you on maybe over the summertime and see how things are progressing yep. and some key races to watch. Because, you know, when does polling season actually begin? When do people start doing the polls? Is it August? September? August, July, August. July, August. They'll start looking at races at where they are and what they need to do. And, and, uh, and people come to you. They do polling because it gives them an idea of where to spend their money. Is that what they do? Well, or or, or what's important to voters? Okay, you know they yeah. may have they may think that this issue is important, and then voters say that's not as important as this issue, and so they need to. And I always defend that action and say you should be listening to what your voters say. You know, if you mm -hmm. think issue X is the most important issue, and it's really X, issue Y, you better talk about issue Y. You're That's right. who you're employing. I know, I know uh, Senator Manchin's camp, they used to always say, before Joe Manchin speaks, he's already polled it. Well, he knows what the people are going to react to. He 100% and what say. does, and he's, he's got his thumb on the, the pulse. He's really good at, at, at that, knowing where voters are. You talk about health care. Remember back in his Senate, I hate to get drugged down on this, but remember in his Senate race, they tried to use Obamacare against him, and he turned it around and became, I'm an advocate for health care and health insurance yeah. for West Virginians. That's a strength of mine, and I always will be, whether it's health care subsidies, whether it's Medicare Advantage or Medicaid, whatever it is, he is always at the front of those, those issues. And why? Because he knows it's important to his base voters. He listens to him. He, he listens. That's the key. Yeah. You get to know yeah. all politics is local. Hey, local. thanks, Mark, again for being on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, you're always welcome back here. And it's uh, we got one one election behind us here in 2022. Go. We'll go one one, one more left, and then we move right into a presidential election. That, that's right. It, yeah. It'll never the day after. That's it when never the stops. Begins. Right. Hey, we're going to take a quick break, everybody, on outside the echo chamber. When we come back, we're going to start talking local here around Charleston and Canal County with Ben Fields, our local editor. When we come back. The relationship between a lawyer and a client is based on trust. You have to make certain that the lawyer you hire has your best interests at heart. We typically meet our clients at the worst times of their lives, and it's our job to help them. Over the years, we've been entrusted with some of the biggest cases in West Virginia. That's because we have a track record of success and getting exceptional results. We built a reputation as one of the go-to law firms throughout the state of West Virginia. Joining me, a uh, high-profile lawyer, Ben Salengo. Ben, it's a real honor to have you on. In fact, many of our cases come from other lawyers, lawyers who've worked with us, lawyers who've worked against us, and even those who've merely heard of our results. We're proud of the reputation we've earned in the community for providing exceptional, aggressive legal representation. When you hire my law firm, you don't get excuses, you get results.
People keep asking me how Todd Judy Ford has the best selection of vehicles at a time of national shortage. The secret is our 130% of Kelly Blue Book for your trade-in. Everyone wants to trade the car with us and get more money. And now we're making it even better. We will beat any other dealer's trade offer by $1,000 guaranteed. If we can't beat it, we'll just give you the cash. So bring in that car, upgrade your vehicle, and get top dollar for your trade-in now. Just go to ToddJudyFord.com and see for yourself. Here in West Virginia, we're known as hard workers, friendly faces, and people with a caring spirit. At Summit Community Bank, those qualities are at the core of all that we do. We're a group of experienced professional bankers that you've known for many years. We work hard to earn your business and will work even harder to help you succeed. We customize banking solutions that work for you. We're Summit Community Bank. Service beyond expectations. Welcome back, everybody, to Outside the Echo Chamber. Uh, we just heard about a lot of uh, state uh, races here with Mark Blankenship. We talked about the congressional race state. Now we're going to talk with Ben Fields, our editor here uh, at the Gazette Mail, who runs the opinion pages and everything. And he's got a real good pulse on the ground when it comes to Charleston election in Kanawha County. Ben, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back so, on. So we had you on before the election. Right. Now we're having you on after. So quick thoughts, yeah. initial reaction after Quick the thoughts. I, I'm a lot happier, uh, <laughs> a lot more relieved. Uh, opinion editors love it when an election is done. That's right. Uh, but, you know, really, I, in actually analyzing the election, there weren't many surprises. Uh, I think the only one I, I really think was surprising in uh, the, the state primaries was uh, Diana Graves, the incumbent being upset um, in, uh, in that primary. Um, but, you know, I think that might have been a public education issue you know her well you talked to, was, we talked about Diana because he, he was pretty well known he was a teacher right, right? He was he's a on the Nitro City Council so. and uh, she kind of got caught with the redistricting too because right. a more majority of of that new district was his base so to speak as opposed to where right. she came from so yeah. um, that was an interesting one you had a lot of incumbents we wrote about Lacey wrote an article today about 10 incumbents around the state they uh, right. are going to be changing over to a new we had the uh, there was somebody just, it was going to happen regardless because right. you had incumbent versus incumbent, but we saw that yeah. around the state. Yeah, redistricting set up a lot of those races where incumbents were facing each other. Hey, we talked we talk about, and uh, we've already talked about this, we're going to touch on it again real quick. Your yeah. thoughts, you wrote a nice piece today, uh, primary sets up intriguing November matchups Does in it? Senate <laughs> District 8. Yes. Talk about that. Yeah, me. well, of course, you know, we've talked about Senate District 8 ad nauseum. That was right. the, the uh, district in which An Andrea Kiesling, who was probably the front runner and the party choice on the Republican side, was found to be ineligible. She hadn't lived here for the requisite five years. She had lived in North Carolina until at least two years ago. And so that opened the way for either Josh Higginbotham, who's an established, you know, conservative in the House, but not someone that the, the further right wanted getting into office. And Mark Hunt, who's essentially a Democrat, <laughs> uh, he served in the State House for 14 years on and off as a Democrat, and he switched parties uh, th to see if he could get through this primary. And lo and behold, all of this stuff happens, and, and now he's, he's in the general election running against uh, the incumbent Democrat Richard Lindsay in District 8, which includes parts of Kanawha County and parts of Clay and other counties now uh, through the redistricting process, uh, probably done to loosen up that Kanawha County stronghold on that district. Yeah. But now you have essentially two Kanawha, two County, Kanawha County Democrats, Democrats kind of, yeah, running, running against each other. Uh, funny how that worked out, but I don't yeah. want to give away your whole column, but you talked about in here how GOP operatives were kind of, you know, dissing Mark Hunt, I guess, uh, during this primary. And sure. then Andrea got disqualified right. and Mark Hunt became the front runner and now he's their nominee. Right, it'll be interesting to see, you know, I, I, I go back to when, for instance, Governor Jim Justice switched parties. He was a Democrat up until December of 2017 and he went to a Trump rally in Huntington uh, that day and announced yeah. he was switching parties. There were, I, I mean, even the state chair of the, of the West Virginia Republican Party that day they had been launching fusillades against <laughs> Governor Justice on Twitter, yeah. and he switched parties, and all of that was gone. 
instantly. Uh, just it's funny how just that happens. Completely, right? yeah. Funny. <laughs> We've always loved Governor Justice. We, you know, there was a few who were, you know, brave enough to say, <laughs> "I don't want this guy in my yeah. party," but most pretty much just. Uh, especially since he did it at a Trump rally. I That's think. right. That's right. Most said, uh, you know, we've we've always loved Jim, and and so it'll be interesting to see if they do the same, same thing, thing with Mark Hunt. Uh, obviously, you know, lower level. Um, Let's see if they do that, or if they just stay out of it. They might just stay out of it they altogether, could. and just because yeah. they're both pretty uh, pretty high name recognition with the Senator Richard Lindsay, Mark right. Hunt, and they're both lawyers here in Kanawha County. Hey, what's uh, what's switch gears to Charleston City sure. Council? You wrote a lot about. Uh, the city council seats, and especially the uh, the incumbents uh, that that won, and mm-hmm. a couple newcomers, and that big that big at large yeah. district. You know, I think let's start with uh, Caitlin Cook, Jennifer Farr, mm-hmm. Becky Separley, and Emmett Pepper. They all survived, right? Okay. Uh, you said on the you said on the show last week there was a couple other solid choices. You know, Jonathan Frazier was uh, yeah, one of them. And, yeah, uh, I'm surprised and, that Jonathan Frazier didn't actually uh, end up being among them. And one of the names I forgot uh, on on Tuesday. Joe Solomon. Uh, That's right. Yeah, we both did. The other one I forgot was Corey Zinn. So apologies for that. But uh, Joe got elected. Joe got elected. Uh, Yeah, he came in the primary, as did uh, Sean Taylor. Right. So talk about Joe Solomon for a minute. Well, Joe Solomon, he's he's an interesting guy because he's on the 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 Charleston can't wait platform, Mm -hmm. which is a it's a smaller version of the West Virginia can't wait uh, platform, which is you know pretty. Skews left yep. on social issues. You know, Joe was involved with the SOAR program, which was a needle exchange in the West End that was very controversial. Uh, not, I, I don't think because of the service it was providing, but just because of the way that it that it opened. But he's he's a huge ad- advocate for harm reduction. He's a huge advocate for uh, you know reducing homelessness the right way, uh, and you know I, I think. And, and he ran in 2018 also, so he, he had some name recognition, and, uh, I, you know, good for him that he got on there. It, it's, uh, uh, it certainly sets up an interesting uh, yeah, choice the, for November because then those four Republicans that's come what, in. That's what so we, say. We went from 15 candidates to 10. <laughs> uh, it's still a good-sized race you right. know, for six spots. Uh, you know, you have a couple incumbents as well, too. And Courtney Persinger, you know, he's been on right. council a few parts. He's now running at large. Uh, we, we also talked briefly about Sean Taylor in the Democrat. Former he's a, he's municipal, a judge. former municipal judge. Uh, also he's, on the board of Manameal, so he's... Knows a lot of people around town as well, too. He'll yeah. be a tough to beat. Um, and he had Mark Sad, I think. Mark Sad, he pulled right. through in the primary. You had a B- Bashera, uh, a mm-hmm. newcomer to politics. So it'll be an interesting fall when it comes to the at-large. Talk, Absolutely. Talk about the mayor's race for a minute. Okay, now we have a yeah. pretty uh, pretty interesting mayor's race starting to shape up. You right. have uh, Lance Wolf, who was unopposed in the primary, right. Republican. And Amy, of course, uh, Amy Schuler Goodwin, right. our current mayor. So talk about that. What do you think uh, for the upcoming mayor race? What does that look like? And what are some, uh, obviously, some of the main issues they'll focus on? The main issue will be uh, homelessness, whether, you know, uh, there are differences, I think, in how that, in what the issue is, and how it's perceived, um, and it gets a little confusing. Uh, and I think you know it's complicated by mental health and the you know the drug problem in West Virginia. Uh, but there are, are a couple of different approaches to that. The mayor's has been to establish a care team uh, that is trying to address the issue. Whether it's doing so effectively or not is still up, you know up for debate, but, you know, it's a long process. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it comes down to whether or not people see less homeless people on the street or whether they feel safe in Charleston, whatever their definition of that is, that's going to be the main issue. And it's it's going to be how they address that. I don't know uh, Lance... Lance Wolf's stance on on all of that, I'd, so I wouldn't venture to guess how he's going to approach it. But well, do you think he can? Do you think a candidate can win just on that one issue? You think just that's that one issue is going to decide, or like all the other stuff when it comes from infrastructure, I, when it comes from jobs, when it comes from cleaning up the city? I mean, right. Well, uh, possibly. You know, uh, one, one thing about being a one issue candidate is that it's simpler. Mm. Um, and and making things sound simple and making solutions sound easy uh, is effective. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, you know, uh, Goodwin's an incumbent and she does have a lot of other irons in the fire. I think a lot of the stuff that, uh, uh, you know, I think she's going to have a good summer because COVID is fading. 
uh, Slack Plaza just reopened, or the, the city center at Slack Plaza. Uh, like the Regatta coming up. For the Regatta is coming so. back, which people have wanted for years. So I think that she's got some runway here to mm-hmm. build up some momentum. Uh, you know, whereas you know during COVID she was working very hard, uh, but it was just you know you you didn't see it as much because you know everyone was you know in some state of of isolation on and off for two years. So. Uh, you know, yeah, she, she, got she, had, the she had to yeah, handle she, that in her yeah. first term, which, <laughs> yeah. you know, I think the administration and, and the Connell County Commission, Commission, for that matter, did a really good job of responding to. But that wasn't as, you know, not as visual as the things people are going to be seeing now. It's like, congratulations, you were just one mayor, you have all these great ideas right. you want to do, and then two months later, yeah, COVID here, hits. Here's and, a once in a hundred years once in a hundred year pandemic. Uh, pandemic that you have see to deal you with that. for the next two or three years of your of your term. So, right. No, I'm, I'm anxious to see how that unfolds. I think there, you know, she's uh, she's got a lot going on right now. Mm-hmm. Like you said, there'll be a lot of things, and she, uh, Marquis, uh, you know, had a primary against her. He's right. real involved in the community. He was on the show. Great person as well. Yeah. So I, I just applaud people who get involved in the process. They get Absolutely. out, they throw their name in the hat, and I hope he stays involved I, in some capacity I wouldn't well. do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, but, it's, uh, it's not always fun, you know. Right. Uh, the, best, uh, the best election is when you don't have a competitor in the primary. Right. Um, but uh, lastly, before I let you get out of here, we have uh, a couple of intriguing House of Delegate races around Canal right. County. Uh, we talked about in, 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 your, in your column as well, too. Uh, yes. Larry Pack will be facing Kayla Young. Right. Um, based on, you know, the, the, the street hustle that Kayla does. She's always out there. She's working right. it. She's known around, reads every bill, going against Larry Pack mm-hmm. and his his empire and his right. money and, and how strong he is as a candidate. Yeah, it, it'll be, uh, that's an intriguing one to me also because it is, uh, it is another one that got set up by redistricting. Um, and I, I think, you know, they are two very different candidates. Kayla is very much... Street level, mm-hmm. you know, uh, hustle. Not to say that Larry doesn't go no, Larry, Larry's, constituents, yeah, no, but he's, he's great. He's Kayla's great more community. grassroots. Grassroots, that's and, the right And, word. you know, Larry is more established, I, I think I would say. He's um, more established. He's involved in the church community. He does a lot right. for, you know, different organizations. You know, he work with, with his, uh, with his uh, senior homes and that, whatnot. So. They're, they're, both, they're both first-termers, so it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out. I mean, I think Kayla's got a very strong support base, but so does Larry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I, I think the edge goes to the Republican just because of the, you know, the setup of the political landscape here in West Virginia. But I don't think anyone's going to outwork Kayla. So She's uh, one of the hardest workers I know. Yeah, saying, that's so sure, she, yeah. she is going to campaign hard, and I think that's going to be a tight race. It's going to be a tight race indeed. So, and then we'll see, we'll see how it shakes up because, you know, in our county we have uh, a lot of new districts, a right. hundred new districts to be yes. exact. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of those were, were set up to, to, to pit some incumbents and get rid of some incumbents, right. uh, which, which happened, like we talked about in the article today at the beginning of the segment, 10 new Ten incumbents will be gone and come back. We do actually have a couple that will come down to actually contested ballots or absentee right. ballots. So there's always a, there were so many of those races were decided by ten or ten or less votes. Yes. So yeah. we'll see how that shapes yeah, the out. Margins as well too. were small. So we'll see. But hey, Ben, uh, appreciate what you did and your team. I know election night is always uh, is always a long and challenging day for for everyone involved in it that. Is. And it is, team. and it is a group effort. Yeah, absolutely. Thank your team, and we'll continue yep. to watch it. We'll see how everything transpires across the summer. All right, thanks we'll a lot. We'll have you back on here, and we'll we'll absolutely. get ready for the fall. It'll be here before you know it. Can't wait. Hey, we're gonna uh, we're gonna take a quick break, and as we wrap up here on outside the echo chamber. Here at Dutch Miller Jeep in South Charleston, we realize car shopping can be challenging right now. That's why we're committed to holding your hand through this process. Don't see the Jeep you're looking for on the lot? Then ask about the Dutch Miller Advantage, which means you can order the vehicle you want faster, direct from the manufacturer. It's no wonder we continue to be the number one Jeep dealer in the state of West Virginia. For a limited time during the Jeep Celebration event, make no payments for 90 days. Text or chat now at DutchMillerJeep.com. Looking for a friendly bank that you can turn to in your community? Bank where the decisions on your needs are made locally. With online banking and seven locations. Polka Valley Bank, where relationships matter. People keep asking me how Todd Judy Ford has the best selection of vehicles at a time of national shortage. The secret is our 130% of Kelly Blue Book for your trade-in. Everyone wants to trade the car with us and get more money. And now we're making it even better. We will beat any other dealer's trade offer by $1,000 guaranteed. If we can't beat it, we'll just give you the cash. 
So bring in that car, upgrade your vehicle, and get top dollar for your trade-in now. Just go to Toggety4.com and see for yourself. Thanks again for joining us this morning on Outside the Echo Chamber. It's been a pleasure being your host today. Big thank you to our guests, you know, our opinion editor, Ben Fields, who just had a, <laughs> he can get a little bit of sleep right now. The election is behind us and then be gearing up for the fall election. Big thank you to Mark Blankenship. Mark Blankenship Enterprises, pollster here around the state of West Virginia, does a great job getting a pulse on the issues. Hey, just remember, you can uh, watch all of our shows as they're archived out there on the charlestongazettemail.com, herald-dispatch.com. We come to you with a new episode every Tuesday and Thursday at 9.30 a.m. And remember, email us. Email us your thoughts, issues, ideas, possible guests at outside the echo chamber at hdmediallc.com. Thanks again to all those people that got out there and vote. Big thank you to the people who put their name on the ballot. It's always tough to do. But we have this election behind us. Now we'll see the people moving to the front during the summer and what they do to gain your trust and your vote as we get to the general election in 2022. Thanks again, and have a great day, everybody.